First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians 4. And I'll read so we can move along a little bit faster. First Thessalonians 4, um, starting in verse 15. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not, be, shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord so Jesus in the rapture when he comes to call these people away he's not coming down to earth the, the overcomers are going to be caught up to be with him and meet him in the air okay he's not going to, he's not going to come down and it's right after this then that the antichrist comes on the scene so he, the, he can't fight the Antichrist because the Antichrist hasn't come down yet. He hasn't come on the scene yet. So, so it's, he's going to be up here. In, um, can you all read it? I see you squinting, so I don't know if you can see. I've got handout sheets to give you all. You want to go through the time chart? Well, let me hand these out and then you won't have to squint so much you know what I'm pointing at. Somebody? Probably do it at the very bottom. Here's, here's one. I've got another type here. It's not... Don't pay attention to this over here. We're going to see this tomorrow. Let me get the same one if I can find it real quick. Sister Hicks has a time chart, but it's real complicated. Uh -huh. Let me get this one. It's simple. You want to know more about that? It's interesting. Okay, this is the same one you all have, right? So here we read the, that he's coming in the air. This, the Old Testament is, is the time of the law. The New Testament is the time of grace. Okay? Because in the Old Testament they, they, they carried out the laws, the ceremonies, they had sacrifices, they had all of these, these um, different rituals that they went through to bring about their salvation in quotation marks to, to cover them and to keep them so it's the time of, of law but when Jesus came then he shed his blood so now everybody who believes on Jesus can be saved and they come under the, the blood covenant then of Jesus Christ this is also called the, the, um, the church age and this is where the seven churches of revelation fit in because each one of these churches had to do with a dispensation historical dispensation in time uh, it had to do with the, the, the apostolic age then it had to do with the martyrs time then it had to do with the beginning of the catholic church then it had to do with the dark ages the beginning of the dark ages then the later dark ages then with the reformation with Martin Luther and the backslidden church that we, we live in now the Laodicean age and so it's the, it's the church age right now 
And then is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where he's going to come and he's going to come for those that are overcoming. He's not going to come for everybody. He's going to come for those that are overcoming. Those that are living on the level of light that they have received. These are the ones that are going to be caught away because it says that the ones that sleep, that are uh, asleep in Christ, the ones that are in Christ, the dead in Christ are going to rise first and then we which are alive and remain. How many Christians are alive and how many church Christians remain faithful right now? Mm -hmm. Yes. The only advantage we have over a lot of people is that we have more word so that we can run more quickly and we know where we're going. A lot easier and a lot better than, than other people. That's the only advantage. Nothing else. And there'll probably be people in the bride out of other churches if they get their foundation set, the blood, fire, and water. They can, they can grow up then also. Like this church here, they've got intercession, they've got blood, fire, and water. There, there could be people out of this church and, and other churches, different places. Uh, uh, a Catholic nun got baptized in Jesus' name in Mexico. Secretly, but she got baptized. She saw it and she wanted it. And Whether she gets the Holy Ghost or not, but there was a, there was a strong uh, Pentecostal movement going through the Catholic church in Mexico. So supposing she gets her whole, salva her whole foundation, she could make the bride. So being a, a member of Christ's gospel doesn't put us in the bride. Talk about other Catholics when they receive your confirmation. That's when you're supposed to receive the gift of tongues. And, and <laughs> it doesn't come. <laughs> there's Catholics, different Catholics, I guess, all over the world. Mm -hmm. So then, um, this is the this is the rapture here. Okay, let's go to Zechariah 14. Verse 4. And in the Word of God, whenever you see the phrase, the day of the Lord, the day of His vengeance, um, the day of the, of, the, of the wrath of God, all of these terms refer to the second coming. When He's going to come back with anger, when He's going to come back with wrath, when He's going to come back to judge the sin of the earth and the sinners that are, have accepted the Antichrist and come under his rule and reign and accepted him as, as their God, then, then, then God's going to become very, very upset at that and he's going to come, Jesus is going to come back then. And it says here in verse 1, Zechariah 14, 1, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. And it goes on until verse 4, and it says, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. So in Thessalonians we read where he's going to be in the air. And yet here he says he's going to, his feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. But he's going to touch the Mount of Olives when? In the day of the Lord. When he comes in the air, he's not coming back with vengeance. He's not coming back for, with warring. He's not coming back with, with, uh, with tremendous uh, power. He's just going to be caught up and he's going to, he's going to take his bride and his, the bridal party and, and all of his children that are overcoming, he's going to take them out so that his judgments can start falling on the earth and calling attention to the, all the people down here on earth not to accept the Antichrist, that there is a God in heaven that's doing all of this down here. So then, so then at the end of that, then he's going to come back. Jesus is going to come back and touch the earth, literally. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between those two. Let's go to Song of Solomon. And you'll understand it where I was going in just a few minutes. You'll understand it even clearer. If we can get where I was... Isn't that where John the Baptist is supposed to be the best 
Mm-hmm. In Song of Solomon, chapter 6, of course, you all know the Song of Solomon, the Song of, the Song of Solomon is a love song between the bride and the bridegroom. Okay? And it says here in verse 8, it says, For there are three, four, three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my undefiled, is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughters saw her, and who are these daughters? They're the daughters of Jerusalem. So they're believers. Uh, saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. So here we see in, in the bridal party, we see people that will be at the wedding. Queens, concubines. These are people that have tasted of a love relationship and they've given it up. They haven't gone farther in and pressed on in to become the, the one faithful one the one, the select one. You know, in, in the Old Testament times, in the old times period, the kings had lots of wives. Poor Solomon got into a lot of trouble because he had so many. But of all of those, there was still that one favorite one. David had a lot of wives, but there was still that, that special one that, that, that they had their favorites. Okay? And um, so it's saying here that there's going to be these queens, there's going to be these concubines, there's going to be the bridesmaids, the virgins. The virgins have to do with the bridesmaid. But my dove, my undefiled, is one. So what, he's not going to take out just the bride. Because what's, what's the bride? The bride and bride, bridegroom just come up to the altar and the, the church is empty? There's, there's a bridal party. There's, a, there's going to be a party up there. There's going to be a big party one of these days. And there's going to be a lot of people invited. There's going to be... Many people that will be there, but they will not be in the bride. So the bridal party, part of them is already gone. In the other, in the, at the time of the wedding, they'll all, they'll, there was a resurrection here, there's a resurrection here, and, and they'll already be up there for the, for the wedding. So there's, there's some that are already up there, and they're gonna be, there's going to be a wedding party, which has to do with the, the, you know, when the bride comes in and she's got all of her bridesmaids and they stand on both sides. And even in a wedding, you, you have the visitors, you have the family members, you have the daughters, the cousins, the aunts, the uncles. Everybody's there to, to, to join in the happiness of the bride. So if in the natural, the same is, is true as in the spiritual. So there is going to be a, a, a party, there's going to be a, a wedding, but there's only one group that's going to be the bride. And that's that special group that have, have sold out completely in, in this life to doing the will of God and being transformed into His image in this life. So where do the um, bridal party go when the Lord gets ready to come back with the bride? Okay, that's where I'm headed. We'll see that in a minute. Okay? But is this clear here then in... in um, what do I do with it? In Zechariah, it says that his feet, he will come down and he'll touch the Mount of Olives and it'll be opened up and the Jews then will run into that valley and be saved from the, the great battle of Armageddon. This is the battle of Armageddon right here, this black block that you see on there. And that's what they were saying if, if, if Saudi Arabia was Armageddon or the beginning of Armageddon. And I told my cousin, was no, not really because Armageddon is a little bit farther down the line. We have to go through the tribulation yet. So let's go back to Revelation. Revelation 19. Verse 7. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So at this point, the wedding takes place up here in heaven when there's still the tribulation is going on down here. You'll see it in just a minute. The tribulation is still taking place, 
but there's a wedding going on up after the after a judgment of Christ and there's going to be a wedding in heaven and then after the wedding read on down a little bit farther and in verse 11 it says and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and his righteousness and in righteousness doth he judge and make war his eyes were a flame of fire and his head and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God and he, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen clean and fine linen white and clean so these armies that are this is when Jesus after the wedding Jesus is going to come back in his second coming and he's going to have armies with him. Mm -hmm. And we know it's going to be the bride because what is what are these armies dressed in? Fine linen. And none of the other groups here in the book of Revelation have fine linen. So it's only the bride going to come back with him at this second coming. And if you read on down then, it talks about the fact that the beast, verse 19... And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat upon the horse and against his army. So we know that st the beast is still very alive and a well at this point. But, and he sets up his, his um, artillery to get Jesus and his army. And Jesus is going to come down then with his bride and, and finally judge this earth for all of the sin from from beginning of time basically. With, with his judgments and, his, and his, his tremendous power. He's going to come down as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in verse 16. And his armies, his bridal army, the, the bridal court will not come with him, only the bride. The, the invited people, the other overcomers of different statures, they will not be with him. Only the bride's going to have that privilege of coming back because only she's going to be the one that's trained to stay in line, to stay under his orders, to stay in subjection not wander over here and not wander over there and not want to do this and not get jealous because she can't be up in the head, head realm with him and, and so they're gonna, it's going to be a very well trained group of people that's going to come back with him at that time and that training comes now while we're still alive over here on this side of the, of the rapture that's why it's important for us to get in now and run on now and learn now because once we're taken up it's going to be too late there's no boot camp up here <laughs> I have a question. Um, we're coming back down. There's still going to be humans left alive on earth. Mm -hmm. But we're going to be in our glorified, glorified form, right? Yes. So that means those humans that are like us now, but then will see us in a glorified form. Mm -hmm. Isn't that going to blow them away, or will they have already seen enough? Well, they would have already seen enough. <laughs> They're going to see... Jesus in person and, and the bride and I mean it's going to be a tremendous thing you try to think about it even science fiction that man can dream up it isn't going to compare to what's what's ahead for this old earth in a very short time yeah a lot of times though, a, lot, a lot of things are happening right now on the earth that people do not even it doesn't phase them mm -hmm. because they get so acclimated to seeing so much bizarre and it's just bizarre yeah and right now the, the whole the whole world is getting tuned in to what's going to happen in the tribulation we have all of these these weird movies that I hear about you know it, it's normal for an ET to be a, a member of your household it's normal for a little evil spirit to walk around and be your spirit guide and to be your friend it's normal for all of this, these spirits and, and wickedness to, to be in your be a normal part of your life so what, what it's doing is desensitizing people to the spirit world uh, all of the all of the witchcraft and all of these the Satanism and things are just growing tremendously, and people don't see anything wrong with it. it you know, it's just another religion. It's another it's another sect. It's another thing to get into. And what it's doing, it's setting up people to accept the supernatural. So when the supernatural on the good side comes, it won't probably surprise them too much because they'll already during the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to work through his spirit army. To control and to, to do all of his 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 governing and, and his evil, so it's going to be normal for them to see and, and hear and and be in, in contact with all of this spiritual world world around them. 
so at the time of the millennium when the millennium starts all of that will be ended and these will be people that would have come out they've gone through the tribulation they're going to be saved through all of the bombardment of Armageddon and they'll come in live with human bodies physical bodies into the millennium but they'll, it'll be, it won't be super surprising because they've already seen so much around this point here okay so the armies that come back with him are going to come back and they're going to fight against the Antichrist and then if you read over in, in chapter 20 it mentions the, um, the millennium reign um, the last part of verse 4 it says and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years and in verse 7 it says and then and when the thousand years are expired Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and they shall go to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth Gog and Magog and so these um, this, there is a millennium I heard a pastor on the radio the other day saying there wasn't such a thing in the Bible as the millennium I said you haven't read the book of Revelation brother <laughs> because it definitely says a thousand years a thousand years a thousand years and at the end of that then I just put this little diagram here it, for Gog and Magog it's not really a battle they come up against the Lord and God's going to rain fire down on them I, verse 8 they shall go out to deceive the nations Gog and Magog verse 9 and they came up uh, on the breadth of the earth and com compassed the city of the saints about and the beloved city Jerusalem and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them so at this the second little square here you can write in Gog and Magog but it's not really we call it a battle but it's not really going to be a battle they arrange themselves to fight but God's going to say this is it I'm not taking any more and he's going to just rain fire down on them and, and kill them immediately at that point and then after that what happens verse 11 and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it and whose, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and so the big great white throne judgment takes place I saw the dead small and great stand before God the books were open and another book was open which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in those books according to their works the sea gave up the dead which were in it and, the, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to his works so this is the great white throne judgment or the, the judgment of all dead when everybody that hasn't been judged up to this point is going to be resurrected evil, good it says big and small free and bond everybody's going to be judged some point in their in their existence and this is the this is the big judgment that we usually think of when we're thinking about God's judgment seat and then after this judgment then what did John see in verse 1 of chapter 21 and I saw Away, and there was no more sea. And, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Amen. So here we see when eternity starts, then, then the people that will have been judged here at this judgment are going to be assigned basically to the new heavens or to the lake of fire. This is, the, this is the judgment seat where they're going to either go here or they're going to go here to the new heavens or the lake of fire and eternity starts and I asked them in, in a group in Mexico I said if these the new heavens the new city and the, and the new earth these are places of, of blessing they're places where God's presence is going to be who's going to inhabit those places who's going to be there Christians so that means that there's Christians are going to go to different places not everybody's going to have the same reward not everybody's going to have the same place in eternity people are going to be divided up according to what they have of the Lord Jesus Christ in this life Amen let's go to Colossians chapter 1 these are all basic basic verses 
Colossians 1, 27. And it says, Colossians 1, 27, it says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is your hope of glory today? Hmm? But how do you know you'll get there by this verse? Salvation. Um, what is my hope of glory today? Oh, Christ in us. Uh-huh. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And remember the heart that I've made a while ago? How do we get Christ in us? Outside of salvation. No, it's the word. It, it's the it's those um, those little areas. Christ in me, the hope of glory. So how how am I going to get Christ in me? What did we see a while ago? How do I get how do I get Christ in me? By identifying the area that you're sinning and then uh, confessing it. And then repenting of it, and then asking the Lord to uh, cover it with the blood and to, to, for him to do what he needs to do. Mm-hmm. And he comes in, and then he comes and fills in that empty place, right? Mm-hmm. So that's how I get Christ in me. So if I want my, if my hope of glory, if I want a lot of glory, my hope of a lot of glory depends on what? So if I want a lot of glory, what do I have to have? A lot of Christ. And if I'm going to have a lot of Christ, then what does that mean? A lot of crucifixion. <laughs> it's that simple. That simple. If I, want to, if, I want, if I want to make the highest place, then I've got to have a lot of crucifixion so I can get a lot of Christ inside of me. Pardon? That's why it's the crucified way. Exactly. That's why it's called the crucified way. There's no way to the bride outside of this. As much as we would like it. We would love it if, if the hours that we dance, he's writing it all down. <laughs> and, the, and the times we fast, even though it's not quite ex- exalting to fast, he writes that all down. And the hours that we're in prayer meetings, oh, that writes it And the, the hours that we spend here, and by the time he adds that all up, he said, okay, 200 million thousand hours, you made the bride. By all your dancing and all your sweating and all your... It'd be, it'd be neat that way. Uh-huh. It is. Yeah, you need, you need the theory. You need the dance. You need the prayer meetings. You need the fasting. That is only going to help us get in a condition so that we're willing to be crucified. So we can, we can, and the fire will burn out areas and, and a lot of things that maybe we can see tomorrow. A lot of different things like that. But, but those things are, those things are good, they're needful, but that's not what's going to make us the bride. <laughs> Great big words. Mm-hmm. And then you ask them, how many, you want to go to the bride? Yeah, I'm going to be in the bride. Glory, hallelujah. And the only ones that are being deceived are themselves. Because there is no way outside of the cross. Our hope of glory is Christ in us. He's got it. He's got it fixed. And in First um, Corinthians, and if you if you apply the things, if you work, if you work it this way, um, it'll work. You'll be changed, and you'll make it to the bride. Because God's word, His principles are established. First Corinthians 15, 
verse 41. It says, There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. What is my hope of glory? Christ in me. So also is the resurrection of the dead. In other words, when you're resurrected, you're going to be resurrected as a sun glory, as a moon glory, or as a star glory. And the, the amount of light that's going to shine out of me depends on the amount of Christ that I have within me, which depends on the amount of crucifixion that I've let Him work in me through this life. And if we put, if we put the new heavens, the, the, the star, the sun, the moon, in the new heavens and new earth, where would I put the, the stars? Well, let's start with the sun. Where would I put the sun? New city. New city. That's, those are the ones that are going to have a lot of Christ shining out of them. Because this glory is going to be the glory of Jesus Christ. The moon glory. Mm -hmm. So would it be the new heavens or the new earth? Mm -hmm. Let's go see. Let's let's go see these three groups in Revelation, and then you tell me which one goes where. I'm gonna find out which one you all want to be in. I already know, but I'm gonna ask you a little bit later. Revelation chapter seven. Revelation seven, verse nine. And it would be good to make a in your in your spare time when you get home to make a list of all the characteristics you can find in each one of these Bible verses we're going to see in the next few minutes, and and make a comparative list of these three groups, so that you can have very well fixed in your mind where these where these groups differ, and if there's any similarities between them, if they're definitely three different groups, and um, and just. We'll make it clear and you'll see in a minute. But you should do this when you get home. Because the Word of God's going to hold you in the, in the last days. Remember that. And it said, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. How many people are here? A lot. No man can number them. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. So where is this multitude from? It's from the earth. It's not. They're not angels. Or they're not from the universe ninety nine. Or they are human beings from the earth. Okay? Because I mention that because a lot of commentaries sometimes mix in, and they say that some of these groups are angels or whatever. But these are human beings, and they stood before the throne. So they're in God's presence before the Lamb. They're before Jesus, clothed in. What? White robes. White robes and palms in their hands. So here they are. They're standing before the Lord. They're dressed in their white robe. And the word robe here means a long white tunic. Just a simple, simple robe. It's stole in, in Greek. S-T-O-L-E. And it has to do with your salvation light that you get when you're saved. But it's just, just one robe. It's, uh, just one piece of clothing. And they've got their palms in their hands. And they're in God's presence. They're being blessed. Okay? And they cry with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So they're praising God. 
And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might unto God forever and ever. And one of the elders uh, answered, saying unto me, What are those who are arrayed in white robe and whence did they come? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, not out of the great tribulation. They came out of great tribulation. And the great tribulation, when is it? When is great tribulation? All of us are in tribulation right now, one way or another. <laughs> and we look back a few years and we were in tribulation then. We look back in our childhood, we were in tribulation then. We look ahead and we can see tribulation one way or another ahead of us. So life itself is tribulation. Okay? And that, and, but you'll see pastors taking this as meaning out of the great. But the Word of God doesn't put in the article the. It's just great tribulation. Okay? So they come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So these are saved people off of the face of the earth that have come out of this life and they're in the presence of God. They're singing. They have a white tunic and they've got palms in their hands. And therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His what? in his temple where is his temple where is his temple if we can find out where his temple is we can find out where they were right pardon <laughs> let's find out where it is let's go to Revelation 11 God's Word is its best commentary. And thank the Lord for Sister Hicks. Amen. Revelation eleven nineteen, And just the first part of it is all we want right now. What does it say? And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testimony. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Okay. So the temple of God was opened where? Okay, let's go back to chapter 7. And it says they served him how long? Day and night. Day and night. In other places in the, in the book of Revelation where it mentions day and night, it says day and night forever and ever. Remember those verses? So day and night forever and ever, day and night, day and night, day and night. Where are they going to be? They're going to be in the new heavens. So here in the new heavens, we have, let me just put white robes. We're going to have this white robe group, which are innumerable people saved off of the face of the earth. And we know, just counting, just looking back from the, the Garden of Eden all the way through to whenever time ends, there's going to be millions of people saved believers from all dispensations in time and since it's just us here from the other creations that have that believed and were saved in those other creations so it's going to be an innumerable amount of people there but where are they going to be all through eternity in his temple serving him day and night amen and it's going to be a blessed place because he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. But if you look in the original, and what it's saying here, his omnipresence is going to be over them. It's going to be around them. They're going to be blessed even greater than what we are because we've got a, a, a wall of, of evil spirits between us and him right now. But when that's cleared away, his presence is going to be there in a tremendous way. And they're going, to, they're going to be in heaven. A lot of people want to go to heaven, and they'll be in heaven then in a tremendous place. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sunlight on them, nor any heat. All of the affliction, the troubles, the tribulations, 
the passions of this world, the, the, the desires for the, the things of life, all of this hungering and thirsting and, and, and all of the heat and the sun, that's going to be taken away because there won't be any need for it sometime in the future. And the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them. Jesus Christ himself is going to come down and feed them. So they're going to be privileged. They're going to see Jesus. They're going to work with Jesus. They're going to be taught by him personally. And the bride is going to be there. And uh, he shall feed them and lead them into living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Why are they going to be crying? They're going, to, they're going to look up there and they say, I could have been there. I could have been there. If they were crying out of joy, he wouldn't wipe the tears away. The, the, the tear joy, the, the joy tears are, are good. Well, if I was being led into living fountains and waters, I wouldn't cry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd enjoy it. That's what I'm saying. If it were that type of tears, he wouldn't wipe them away because he likes those tears. Well, or else, you know, maybe like because they're sorrows, they're in terms of possibly like wiped away their sorrow from their eyes, you know, that they no longer have any more sorrow. Mm-hmm. Part of it, it has to do with, with them looking and, and seeing that they missed it, but also the day and night principle. You'll see it on the tape. Oh, I didn't touch it this way on the tape. In the, the day and night principle, God is, God is day and God is night. And the day has to do with theory. And the night has to do with...